Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, and welcome. We are thrilled to speak to a global audience today to introduce our latest research report, an in-depth study on the peace process in Mindanao. At the Berkeley Foundation, we support and analyze peace processes in various countries, always seeking to make them more conducive to sustainable development and to lasting just peace. Specifically with the research we're talking about today, we wanted to find out what measures in a particular process have been taken to curb corruption and to strengthen accountability and integrity, and with what effects. The publication of Transparency International's Global Corruption Index just a few days ago has highlighted the unabated importance of this topic. Not only am I welcoming a global audience today, but I'm also welcoming a global array of speakers. My name is Beatrix Austin. I head the Conflict Transformation Research Department at the Berkhoff Foundation in Berlin. In our commissioned research, we asked how actors involved in one specific peace process in the Philippines attempted to curb corruption and strengthen accountability and integrity in governance going forwards. And with me today are the author of this study, Dr. Balash Aaron Kovac, Filipino peacebuilding activist and researcher, Mark Batak, professor of practice at Tufts University and not least a member of our own board at Berkeley Foundation, Diana Chigas, as well as one of Berkeley Foundation's key focal points on inclusive governance, Dr. Joshua Rogers. Let me give you a quick overview of the CRISP program we've prepared for you as well, following an introduction into the research and its main findings by Balaj Kovac, we'll hear short reflections from the three expert discussants. After that, we'll open to a short question and answer session. The report will be available online and you may study it in depth after this event, which serves as a bit of an appetizer. And we hope you take a lot more interesting insights from it. Um, the case study also follows from a broader framework study that um, my colleague Joshua Rogers is going to talk about a little bit um, a little bit later, which serves to really identify what entry points are there for practitioners and supporters for peace processes to address corruption in peace processes and in fostering better or good governance. Um, a quick note on the housekeeping. If you face any technical difficulties, please sort of reach out to the lovely support colleagues that are behind the scenes here. We'll try to um, help you. The event's language today is English only. And if you have questions to our panelists, Please make sure to post them in the Q&A, um, where I can then pick from and bring them into the discussion later. With this, and without further ado, I want to introduce to you the author of the case study, Dr. Balash um, Kovac, with a few more words on his background. Um, he is um, deeply knowledgeable about politics and international studies, which is the area where he has done his PhD. His research focuses on state theory, on local level peace building, and on state society interactions, often in violent contexts. In 2018, he published a book on peace infrastructures and state building at the margins, which also focused closely on the Philippines. Um, and uh, afterwards, he served as the country director uh, for the Philippines of Forum ZFD, which is a German. NGO working in the field of conflict transformation. Um, after that, no, he's become a freelance consultant and researcher, and we were lucky to snap him up for this assignment. Um, Balas, the first thing that uh, I want to sort of give you the, the, the ball to talk about is sort of what key research questions did we send out, send you out to address? Um, what did you investigate and why why are these research questions of relevance? Uh, thank you very much, Bea, and thank you for the kind introduction as well. Um, 
I uh, I read several times the the framework report that you published on this topic. So uh, so I try to frame the questions based on that. So ultimately, what you will find in the report is uh, an investigation of the interplay between corruption accountability measures in response to corruption, uh, peace building measures, and how this interaction or interplay uh, affects the sustainability of uh, peace and the peace process uh, in the Bank Samoro. Uh, I wanted to look at uh, what opportunities were created by uh, the peace agreement itself to curb uh, corruption. Uh, but, and I guess we will come back to this uh, later on. Uh, that avenue did not prove so fruitful. Uh, and finally, uh, what I was really interested in uh, was uh, to find out what people in the context consider corruption, uh, uh, what are their understandings and perceptions of it, and uh, what uh, ways did they see uh, that they could address it and how they perceived the interaction of corruption and peace building uh, in the Bank Samoa. So this is what I tried to address uh, in the report. Thank you. Excellent. And Balas, you highlighted that we were looking at a, one very specific uh, peace process in the Bang Zamora in the Philippines. Maybe you could just quickly frame that for us in in sort of the, the time continuum of the several sort of peace processes and, and one of one very recent one has started, mm -hmm. which might already take some clues maybe from our research. But position us in time and in place one more time. And then uh, would you mm -hmm. would you let would you let us partake in the key findings? What was there uh, that surprised you? Right. Um, so uh, what I focused on in this research is the most recent peace agreement concerning uh, the Bank Samoro. Uh, conflict in Mindanao has been ongoing for at least a hundred years now, but. Uh, from the late 1960s onwards, there have been several major insurgencies um, uh, that sought uh, self-determination for uh, Muslim Filipinos uh, in Mindanao. Um, the most recent peace agreement uh, was signed in 2014 uh, between the Moro Islamic Liberation Front uh, and the government of the Republic of the Philippines. So I focused on the peace process uh, that generated that peace agreement and uh, the implementation that has taken place since the signing of the agreement. So that is uh, the, the primary time frame, the period from 2014 uh, up to almost the present, up to the finishing of the manuscript of this uh, report in 2023. So this, this is the, the, the temporal uh, frame. Um, the Philippines has uh, several uh, internal armed conflicts, and as you just alluded to, uh, the government uh, recently announced uh, the resumption of another major conflict line, the peace negotiations in the other major conflict line in the Philippines uh, with the Communist Party of the Philippines. And while that conflict is very different in many aspects, uh, I hope that some of the lessons that we can learn from this process can be used uh, in this uh, renewed uh, peace negotiation uh, with the Communist Party. Uh, now, to the main findings and, and sort of the surprises uh, that I encountered here. Um, uh, in general terms, uh, what this research highlighted to me uh, is the importance of intentionality, uh, the consciousness uh, uh, of the negotiating parties uh, to address certain issues in the peace process, in the negotiation as well as the implementation, uh, the importance of inclusiveness, uh, the perseverance of the parties to be able to deal with setbacks that uh, that almost inevitably happen in a peace process. And finally, what I would call a whole of country perspective uh, in it. More specifically, I would like to highlight some of the, uh, the more important or more interesting findings uh, of this research. Well, first of all, I found that corruption 
uh, is not an immediate threat to the sustainability of the peace process uh, in the Philippines, um, uh, partly because uh, there are some stabilizing effects of corruption that in the short term help to sustain uh, the momentum of the peace process. Uh, and partly because people are in some ways used to corruption. Uh, so uh, so in, in some sense, there are coping mechanisms uh, and survival strategies of people uh, that that take into account the presence of uh, corruption. Uh, but it does have a slow uh, eroding effect, uh, which can in the long run uh, imperil the sustainability uh, and the legitimacy of this uh, process. So that is that is one finding uh, that, that came out from this uh, research. Uh, the second one, and I will come back to this when I talk about what surprised me, um, is uh, related to the negotiations. Um, and uh, I did not expect this at the beginning of this research, but I found that the, uh, the, the two parties who were negotiating this peace agreement were actually really uh, conscious and intentional about not just corruption, but about trying to find ways to address corruption as part of the peace process. Uh, so that is something that I had not been aware of, this level of consciousness and intentionality. Um, uh, but it was there. Uh, and uh, I found that there was a, I would say, a sort of an idealist and a real politic aspect to this um, uh, awareness and intention to address corruption. Um, the idealistic aspect was obviously the sort of the, the moral wrongness of corruption uh, and the real politic aspect of it uh, had to do uh, uh, with the particular arrangements uh, and 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 sort of conditions of power uh, in the Bank Samoro uh, that the different the two parties uh, sought to somehow change uh, through this peace process. Um, another related finding is that the peace agreement introduces something uh, new in the Philippines that had not been present in Philippine constitutional uh, history, and that is a parliamentary system of government for the Bank Samoro. And what I found in this research is that parliamentarism was introduced in part exactly to address the question of corruption. Uh, so that was a really interesting finding. Um, uh, several of my respondents talked about uh, how the, the national government abandons a little bit the process. It's not that they do not address it at all, um, but uh, they, did, they do not pay the sufficient attention that it requires. There are delays, uh, slow compliance with provisions uh, by the government, um, an abandonment of some of the constitutional duties that the government could carry out in order to help the process along and make it more accountable. And this can generate frustration among people. Um, finally, uh, what I found really interesting, this is nothing new, it's uh, actually very widely talked about in the Bank Samoro, uh, was the concept and the approach that the, the MILF calls moral governance. Uh, and uh, this is, a, to my mind, unique attempt at curbing corruption. Um, it is very progressive in many ways, um, and it is really uh, specifically about creating a better uh, more moral government for the Bank Samoro. What I did find was that it isn't really working, unfortunately, partly because it isn't really defined uh, and partly because of this lack of definition, it is not operationalized properly uh, by uh, the Bank Samoro Transition uh, Authority. So this is, uh, this is the, uh, this would be the main most important or most interesting findings. And what surprised me, uh, this, the, this really strong consideration all through the process of corruption and the rebel to ruler transition. Uh, from the early 2000s onward, the parties were preparing uh, for the MILF to take over 
the Bank Samoro. Uh, they were training themselves uh, and they tried to integrate anti-corruption measures. Unfortunately, in the final text of the peace agreement, there are only two provisions that can be interpreted as uh, as uh, related to corruption, uh, and they are on accountability and inclusivity. Um, both words are quite vague and very overused uh, in this uh, sector. Uh, so uh, they can be interpreted in many different ways. And one way is uh, to deal with corruption, and that's what the MILF is doing now that they are in government. A more cynical interpretation, of course, is that because of the vagueness and the, the overused nature of these words, they are also very easily overlooked. But I don't think that either of the two parties were cynical uh, in, their, uh, in their approach uh, to uh, corruption. And the introduction of moral governance supports that, that, that it isn't a cynical uh, way of addressing it. Uh, but in some ways, it is a compromise between the political realities of the Bank Samoro and the intentions of the, the, the parties. So this was, this was the most surprising part to me, uh, this intentionality. That's it. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, Balash. What strikes me in particular is um, also looking at some of the expectations we have around peace agreements. Um, often practitioners that we speak to highlight that corruption is a very thorny issue. Often it's something that parties do not want to engage in explicitly. There are few peace agreements that really have strong language on it or then strong operationalization or strong implementation. And what strikes me in your, in your report of the findings is that in the peace process in the Bamza Moro, we have a mix of, of a weak, explicit addressing of the issue in the peace agreement, but would you say quite a, 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 con a conscious and a long-term consciousness about the need to do something about it and some sort of normative creativity in addressing it and taking it forward. Um, before I open it out to our other panelists, Balash, I have one last uh, question or a set of questions to you, and that is, um, of what do you see as the main challenges in going forward for the Bangza Moro in sort of achieving even more accountability and reducing corruption even further? Um, I think currently the Philippines overall are still around ranking 134, 35 on that global corruption uh, index. So there's still a way to go. Um, and Next to the challenges, you highlighted that you would hope that there were some lessons to take for the newly starting peace process. Could you pinpoint one or two of the lessons that you would most um, fervently recommend mm -hmm. that the new delegations uh, take on board? Yes, um, I haven't mentioned among the main findings, partly because of the time constraint that we have here. Uh, but another uh, important takeaway from this uh, is this uh, whole of country approach. Um, and uh, I think that is a very important lesson. So in a few words, uh, what I mean by that is that a lot of the talk about the Bank Samoro peace process is really about the Bank Samoro itself contained geographically, contained uh, in terms of population and contained institutionally, contained in terms of the actors, the MILF, the, uh, the other uh, major Moro group, the MNLF and the local political clans and so on and so forth. But in reality, a, a peace agreement, this peace agreement and any peace agreement in a situation like this is for the entire country. Um, and that means that, uh, that uh, changes need to be made not just in that circumscribed uh, locality, that in our case is the Bank Samoro, but the country as a whole, because the country cannot be a peace bubble. I'm using the term of one of my interviewees uh, here. Um, so it's trying to be a peace bubble, but that's not possible. Uh, and so uh, the takeaway for the next peace process with the communists is that maybe, uh, the creative thinking needs to include, you know, addressing constitutional issues of the whole country. Uh, 
Um, and of course, the character of that conflict would probably necessitate that. Uh, but there is a need to really expand uh, uh, the scope of change that needs to be made to the whole country, not just to uh, that particular small area which sought to secede from the from the from the Philippines. So that would be uh, the main takeaway for the next peace process. Um, and the main challenges that I see, uh, I will focus on two now. Uh, one is that I perceive a weakening of civil society uh, in the in the barn. Uh, because of the success uh, of uh, of the peace process and the civil society. And uh, many important civil society organizations saw themselves as part of the self-determination struggle of the Bank Samoro. So a lot of civil society leaders saw it as a natural next step to join the government. But because of this, a lot of the key leaders are now in government and not in civil society anymore. Uh, so there is a hollowing out of civil society because of this. Uh, and I think that has weakened civil society uh, to some extent, uh, because it cannot really uh, practice its controlling function of the government if key leaders are now in the government. So, so that, that, that I see a weakening of civil society, and it needs to be reinforced again. Uh, the other one is... Uh, there will be elections next year, and uh, after that, uh, who knows who will form the new Bank Samoro government, and uh, who knows how much uh, the interest in carrying on this peace process and the implementation uh, will survive the next election. So one challenge, I think, is uh, is a loss of interest in carrying on the peace process beyond the next election. Um, and related to that is sort of a return to the old normal, uh, the reproduction of traditional politics, which have generated a lot of the problems, including a lot of the corruption uh, in the Bank Samoro. Um, and there are signs of that already that the MILF or members of the MILF are sort of gravitating towards that uh, traditional way of doing politics. So these are the challenges that I see uh, coming or the two challenges that I wanted to bring up here. Thank you. Excellent. They, they support one of the learnings or one of the mantras I might say here at the Berkeley Foundation, which is that peace building is really an intergenerational endeavor and that uh, um, the periods that one has to devote attention to are usually long. Um, so that's a good reminder that you give us. Um, thank you. Balash, but thank you ever so much. Um, I would like to turn to our first reflective discussant uh, of the day, and I welcome very warmly Mark Bata. Mark is um, an activist, a peace builder and a researcher based in the Philippines. Um, he focuses uh, strongly on issues of contentious politics, of asymmetric conflict and conflict transformation, as well as social movements in the Philippines, but also in wider Southeast Asia. Mark was program manager for the Initiatives of International Dialogue, a regional peace building and advocacy institution promoting human security, democratization and self-determination. And before that, um, he was also active as a regional um, liaison, the regional officer for the Global Partnership for the Prevention of Armed Conflict, GPAC. Um, nowadays, Mark, you consult on securitization and on militarisms, their impact on human rights, on the civic and deliberate space in the Philippines. And I am very curious what uh, you have made of the study that we've produced. Um, we've shared it with you ahead of time. Um, I think you and the author also are sort of familiar with each other's work. But my question to you is, how did the findings of the study resonate um, with you? What do you find convincing? Where does your own experience maybe depart from what, uh, what was sort of highlighted in the study? And what would your recommendations be for the path forward, both for the Bangsamoro, but also the broader Philippines? 
Thank you for the kind uh, introduction and for um, inviting me to um, join this space. Um, so uh, this is how I think I'll I'll go about it. Um, my my work um both um involves the two uh, uh main uh, peace processes or conflict in the Philippines, both the Bangsamoro and recently the um, communist armed insurgency. And that's, I think, much of the intersection of my work with Balaj in, in the past, I think, five, seven years already. Um, first with, I think, what resonated with me, this is a, uh, you know, a, I've been reading the paper over the past week and there's a lot of things that um, I've picked up and resonated with, um, particularly, I think, you know, the framing of, and a reminder, important reminder that um, when we talk about corruption um, in the barm, it's not just a barm problem. It's a national problem. It's a historical and structural um, uh, systemic um, uh, issue. Um, and it's very interesting, I think, that, uh, you know, at, at, at the onset, I think Balash already pointed out that, you know, um, how the public um, defines or understands or perceives, corrup uh, perceives corruption, um, which is, um, in, in one sense, um, sometimes limited, a lot of times limited to individual moral failings, and the other um, is legalism. Um, uh, um, and, of course, um, I also quite resonate with the second thing that I, I picked up and, and really stuck with me is um, the question of what measures of success of the peace process does the government, both the MILF and uh, the a sitting uh, government has. Both of them are already the, the state. Um, and um, the analysis that it roots, it, it's rooted in the lack of um, follow through of the state and commitments to the ongoing uh, peace process. Um, and finally, I think what resonated is the, you know, the BARM really is in a difficult spot. Um, the regional um, experiment on a parliamentary system sandwiched between um, a national electoral political system and a local political system that is hugely defined still by by patronage i think what what slightly i think you know um i have a, a departure with analysis um and probably not a, a, a real departure but you know just a an addition to you know just pushing the analysis is this point that we usually hear which is that the milf is still learning or struggling to shift from rebels um, to rulers and learning to govern. I think to some extent it's it's I find that true, but at, at the same time I think quite you know quite inaccurate because I think the 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 more important question here is what kind of governance is it, is it pursuing? Because I think in in a modern way of governing which is very bureaucratic, I think it is actually that is part of the critique of the current um, uh, Bangsamoro government that it has went the, the route of a very bureaucratic um, uh, route um, and lost some of the soul or, has, or is currently in the process of reclarifying what is the soul of this project, which is not simply state building, but broadly a long-term peace process or you know societal uh, peace process. So I think the question therefore is, um, uh, what will the uh, BTA, um, currently led by the MILF, will pursue or going to pursue? Is it going to pursue a, um, a you know, a radical track that is rooted in the um, revolutionary um, uh, aspirations of its constituency, um, or will it pursue a conformist and orthodox approach, which is, you know, we are in the system that is, you know, um, patronage heavy. We, when contesting election, will it also you know, partake in in some of those tactics. Will it um, uh, try to um, uh, trade horses with local uh, elites? Will it, you know, will it look the other way when it comes to the camp commanders and the existing and emerging patronage relations of the camp commanders with the communities? So that is, I think, the you know the the question that that is quite you know before. What is the kind of governing and how does that depart to the expectation? of uh, the public, the Bangsamoro um, communities, and also those that supported the peace process. Because I think that is the core issue that is, you know, when we talk about sustainability and legitimacy of the process and of this government and, and of the uh, BTA. Um, because the BTA and, and MILF is, you know, as 
came from that radical aspiration. So any departure to that will, of course, that will be the metrics, I think, that will be one of the key metrics that they would be measured on, aside from you know, delivering efficiently um, uh, the um, public services. But I think that is a question that, you know, for for us who in the peace constituency that that uh, that um, that extended uh, our hand uh, held hands with you know with 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 the Bangsamoro. It's a question among all of us for for the the sitting government. You know, um, will it um, stay true to um, to that uh, transformative um, vision of what the Bangsamoro government, regional government, should be, which is it should be rooted in a deep kind of democracy, inclusivity, and accountability of the regional government to the Bangsamoro people and the, the and and the resident uh, and, and the people of um in the in the territory. But maybe the other thing is maybe let like some reflections on you know on the other peace process. How does this depart to the other peace process, the GRP and the FP? And I think Balaj is correct that I think that the difference lies that it. Corruption, particularly political dynasty patronage and rent seeking, is not only a slow eroding factor for that other peace process, it is a core issue in that armed conflict. So that is not something that, you know, that that if the agreement is being negotiated or if a, the agreement is is um is achieved and we are now in the implementing phase that is something that is something that the the two parties cannot just uh, dribble because for example the comprehensive agreement on the uh, social and economic reforms caser um some of those issues prob problem issues that you know that were identified is rooted particularly in patronage and in the shape of the political you know political system which is you know issues of agrarian reform and rural development that cannot be pursued because a lot of the landed elites um, and and political families constantly um, oppose any of, of of movements of in in that regard in in, in Congress or the national industrialization um, we're in you know it's an issue of how do we we equitably divide um, uh, um, redistribute the pie and you know the environment and you know extractives and 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 whatnot. Um, I, I think some of the and this is my last bit which is you know some recommendations particularly I think shifting back to the barm is. Um, I, I agree, definitely agree with Balash that you know that BARM cannot remain to be a peace bubble. The question is how how does that delicate balance between keeping the peace process afloat and creating conditions to uh, long term and systemic issues? How does that look like? And I think there is the part that you know the MILF and the Bangsamoro CSOs and the peace building uh, community that that were involved in the in the peace process need to engage and lead on the broader systemic issues on governance particularly electoral and political reforms especially at this moment there is the push for the people's initiative on um the uh, reforms to the constitution um but unfortunately it's still the political families the uh, political dynasties that are leading that that push so um so which means that you know it we have to retake that because that is something that limits and shapes the kind of corruption and accountability that is this that is uh, uh, possible within the within the barm and i think secondly is i'd like to pick up then there's the last point is you know this this interesting point of us on national dialogues which i could link to you know to political constituency building and political education and this is partly my answer to that question on how the milf and the BT, you know and and the uh, UBJP should um should exist within this dominant system of patronage. I think we the, the current sitting regional government has to bring the the conversations back again to the communities um to discuss with them flesh out what does moral governance look like for them for 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 the uh, affected communities. What are their aspirations as well for the BARM project and build a constituency away from the patronage and collective uh, you know the platform built by um the local political elites mark but that, thank you so much there is much that we could unpick one thing that resonates very strongly with me because it ties us also to our next contributors is that highlighting that you do that there there is a a systemic there's a systemic force uh, that we need to grapple with um I recommend all of our listeners to really also take note of the of the rich sort of historical and systemic reflections that are in the report um, that really look at uh, corruption, accountability, moral governance as issues that resonate throughout time and that take 
leverage points that we are still sort of, I think, looking to operationalize. I hope we can come back to the question of where in the system are the, the, the leverage points. You've, you've hit, highlighted some, uh, one around uh, electoral reform, um, Balash earlier pointed to sort of constitution making. Those are sort of two that, that I've picked up along the way. Um, with that, though, I would move on to our next sort of reflective discussant and welcome to the Suda Spotlight, uh, Professor Diana Chigas. Um, as I said earlier, she is, for one, uh, a distinguished member of the Berker Foundation's board and has been for the last uh, decade, also um, giving us a lot of impulses to address this issue area. Um, more importantly still, um, she is Professor of Practice of International Negotiation and Conflict Resolution at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University in the USA. Um, and she co-directs, together with Cheyenne Church, the Corruption Justice and Legitimacy Program, a research to practice initiative that aims to improve the effectiveness of anti-corruption programming in fragile and conflict-affected contexts. She brings to this 30 years of experience as facilitator and consultants in negotiation and conflict resolution in too many contexts for me to name. Suffice this though to say that, um, Diana, I wanna make use of that experience by inviting you to take a bit more of a bird's eye perspective. Um, we've sort of been sort of deeply on the ground in the, in the barn in the Philippines. But what I'd like to direct towards you is the question, what are the potential lessons learned from this particular experience? in integrating anti-corruption measures of enhancing accountability um, that, that you think can be taken forward to inspire other peace processes without being able to copy sort of one size fits all approaches. But which lessons would you say really sort of resonate with other uh, contexts? What aspects could be tried and applied elsewhere? Um, but also what lessons really um, should be impressed on sort of the international and local practitioners. The floor is yours. Great, thank you. And thank you, Balaj. It's a really very rich case study. So I really enjoyed reading it. And then every time I get new insights um, of the many things that um, struck me as potential lessons, I'll just focus on, I think maybe two or three. Um, one is I think where you started, which was, the sort of dilemma, which I think makes corruption very hard to deal with, is that it's not an urgent um, problem to address in the peace process. And, um, but over the longer term, it will undermine um, governance and undermine the peace process and eventually potentially lead to recruitment, but um, certainly lead to frustration. Um, and so uh, this idea of being stuck in a negative peace and uh, potentially a violent negative Peace, and so I don't think in many in many other contexts, I don't think it's a coincidence that some of the peace processes end up in a very violent negative peace. And I think the the connection with corruption there um, is often very tight, but though not very focused on. Um, but I was impressed here, and I think it is a lesson that the intentionality um, and there are there were specific historic I think antecedents to the kind of intentionality and um, consciousness with which corruption generally, and corruption is a broad word, so um, it encompasses a lot of different things, but the intentionality by which um, people thought about this and incorporated it, whether it got incorporated in, into the peace agreement, but certainly in thinking about it um, over time. And I think that in order to deal with it, um, it's sometimes very hard in the immediate. Um, so having a longer strategy, um, and that's, I would say that for internationals too, having a longer term strategy in that implementation period and thinking about how to set up some of the conditions in the peace agreement that allow that to happen um, would be something that I think has done been done a bit here and would be a lesson. Um, the, uh, the other that struck me in the case study, and you mentioned it um, only because uh, we've been looking at corruption also through a systemic lens. And I, I was struck because I think it's very common how people view corruption um, as an individual moral failing in a legalistic way. 
Um, and that really does affect how we think about addressing it. And that may um, compromise a bit some of the effectiveness of some of the measures. So I, I corruption in these contexts, um, if it's not, um, I, and I think the case study actually says this, is if you don't address it and see it as a systemic problem, it's very difficult to address. And by systemic corruption, it's networked, it's institutionalized, it's not just in the formal system, and it does have a function. And so um, I think a second lesson that kind of comes out, though I think somewhat implicitly, um, is that the function here, and um, it, Mark, both of you actually mentioned it, is um, some people will say to me in other places, you know, if corruption isn't an exception to governance, it is governance. And the patronage system, this is set in the patronage system, and it has, corruption has a function in sustaining it. So it's very difficult to silo the corruption um, and some of these things from the larger system, both, I think, geographically in terms of the national process, but also in thinking about what kinds of measures one takes. So in thinking about how do you think about the government um, having abandoned or being more accountable, um, is it a reasonable assumption to assume in a system like this that the government um, will actually exercise its oversight effectively? If the principle isn't principled, um, this is where some of the civil society and some of the recommendations around strengthening civil society may come in very helpful um, because uh, I'm not sure it's a reasonable assumption in these endemic uh, corruption contexts. Um, same thing in terms of thinking about um, moral governance. Um, and I wonder sort of in some cases whether because endemic corruption and some of these systems are so resilient, um, whether some of these pressures and some of the difficulties, I wouldn't say all of them, but um, some of them have to do with the pressures that the systems has to go back. And and I think Balaji you mentioned it sort of back to normal. Um, and so uh, if you don't address some of these systemic pieces, the, the pressures to go back to normal are very, very strong um, over time. And so I think that is a part of the problem with thinking sort of not thinking uh, systemically. And the anti-corruption field, and I'm now speaking with that hat on, um, I think that many of the tools are not um, are not sufficient in thinking about that. And so we're starting to think about new approaches for, um, for dealing with that. And some of them have to be embedded in things like electoral reform and constitutional reform, but some also need to really start addressing some of the practices um, that people have uh, found. Uh, so I would say sort of really thinking about the whole of government and really thinking about some of these other informal processes um, and thinking also, um, I, I think the third third piece would be, um, I think the case study also talked about the need for um, cultural, sort of really a culture cultural transformation. Um, and that's really what systemic corruption is. So there's, I, I think there's a, also a tendency to focus on people's attitudes around corruption. And I think that's important. Um, but how do we change the system in order to, um, how do we change some of the systems in order to promote that? So it's a bit more than political education. So think about that. Um, I think the very final one, just for the international community, there were some cases in the, in the, um, in the case where, when we're thinking about peace types of um, peace actions, and Bal, as you said, you wanted to look at that interaction, we're thinking about what's the corruption sensitivity of some of these peace actions. And so we had the commanders, for example, being the the um, channel of commute the channel between people in the camps and the government. And the case really brings out well how that put them in a position to really incentivize them, incentivize some of the corruption. And so really thinking about sort of how will these kinds of peace measures also then feed into some of these corrupt dynamics, uh, because you don't want to make the problem worse that you then need to address after um, afterwards. Um, so I'll stop there for now. Oh. Diana, thank you so much for being beautifully succinct yeah. and uh, also bringing in sort of your systems thinker yeah. um, hat. Um, I, in the interest of time, I will move directly to our last sort of reflective discussant and welcome to the spotlight, Joshua Rogers. Joshua, as I said earlier, you are a colleague uh, here at the Berkeley Foundation. You are a senior project manager um, who's been sort of uh, involved mostly in the foundation's sort of political dialogue work in, in Yemen, 
and on Yemen and the Gulf region. Um, you advise in particular around inclusive governance in Yemen and uh, lead sort of Berkha's effort to integrate thinking about corruption into peace processes and also political dialogue efforts, but really also broaden it out onto a sort of political economic um, perspective onto a lot of these peace processes that we're looking at through a sort of traditionally through a conflict transformation um, angle. And you're going to sort of take us uh, back a little bit to the beginning of, of our sort of conceptual efforts also of sort of defining what do we actually mean when we talk about corruption? Where does it show up in, in peace processes and what can be done theoretically about it? And this case study of the Bangza Moro um, peace process is is hopefully our first uh, in-depth study of what then in in the concrete realms actually has been tried and with what effects. So Joshua, I invite you to um, sort of give us a little bit of an insight on sort of which of the entry points that we had initially identified um, actually were used here and uh, to what uh, to what effect. Yeah, thanks very much, Bea. Um, also conscious of time, so I'll, I'll try to be quite quite succinct. I think, I mean, first of all, um, the the case and and with a big big thank you to Balash really brings out the the usefulness of taking this political economy approach and and lens to the way that conflict um, and and corruption interact and and how they they play out around a around a peace process. And one of the points that the or one of the starting points, I guess, for the the mapping is the idea that this this depends on the context, and you really have to analyze quite quite closely and and look at what is perceived locally as corrupt. What are the specific um, effects of of different forms of corruption? Where are they maybe in the short term stabilizing and 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 without alternative? But also, you know, what's the long term picture? Where are they really going to to undermine the the peace process and the legitimacy of 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 the piece in the in the longer term where you know what what's going to lead to this kind of negative and, and violent piece that that diana diagnosed as being a, a frequent outcome unfortunately of, of peace processes and so um you know that that doesn't, doesn't generate easy answers and i think the the case also speaks to that and some of the the dilemmas and diana just brought up the case of the the camps and the camp commanders um as as maybe one of these and and one of the things that we argue in the mapping studies is that we need to we need to be talking about these dilemmas and acknowledge them and 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 have a conversation between people trying to support peace processes and, and build peace and and you know more the anti-corruption community and and really try and work out what these trade-offs are and and um and so I think that's that's something that that the the case bears out very strongly um as well as the fact that it's often not probably not very helpful to talk about corruption, but rather um, it can be much more constructive to frame it in terms of accountability, about transparency, integrity. As as wishy washy as, as those words might might be, sometimes they are places where you can have conversations that um, you know are maybe a little bit less sensitive, uh, a little bit less prone to to weaponization against political enemies and, and that sort of thing. Um, and I think. The case and, and the discussion now has brought out the importance of really thinking about corruption during uh, peace processes. It's not something that you should start thinking about once an agreement has been signed, because then it's it's too late. This point about the intentionality, the the consciousness of of the conflict parties of the parties to the the peace agreement. You know, even even with that, it's proven quite difficult to to overcome. Um, the the entrenched structures and that's you know i think the the default is for the status quo to 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 be reproduced and so if you're trying to change things you, you need to make a conscious effort and you need to have these these entry points and so having having a, a change in the the electoral system as as imperfect as it as it may be you know that that can be a starting point and i'm not familiar enough with the with the case, but it sounded like that's also becoming a, a point of of mobilization and contention to a certain extent for thinking about further further changes. And I so I think so that's what we what we also mean with the the entry points. Um, I think the case also highlights the the potential role of of civil society, in particular, the maybe some of the the fungibility, the fact that these 
silos that we sometimes think in in terms of is it is it peace is it corruption is it you know what what box does it belong into um isn't necessarily that meaningful and that networks and um, capacities that are developed for monitoring for example ceasefires can very effectively and potentially be brought to bear for for other questions as well um so I'll, I'll wrap up there and uh, we can have some questions from from the audience Thank you, Joshua, much appreciated. And indeed, we have two questions, I think, that take us back to Balash and to um, and to Mark, because they focus, again, on sort of the concrete process that we were looking at. Um, one picks up on uh, one of the weaknesses that you highlighted, Balash, uh, that was the weakness of uh, having clearly defined and operationalized uh, a, a term like moral governance. Um, and uh, the question is, do you believe that sort of more clearly defining it, more better operationalizing it would have made a difference? Um, would that have been a decisive factor of success? Are there other factors? Um, and the second question asks a little bit whether uh, you had an uh, opportunity to glean from your study, also whether there are geographic differences across uh, the barn. So in particular, whether some of the island provinces, provinces displayed a different patterns maybe, or a different uh, scenario from the one that you describe overall. Um, because we are already coming to the end of this fascinating hour, I also wanna deposit for all of you guys one question that I'd love for you to just give us a one one or two word answer to. And that is sort of, if you look around the world at the peace processes that inspire you or that frustrate you most, where would you like us to throw our analytic lens looking at how to actually use entry points for anti-corruption to build greater accountability, better sustainability? Where would you like us to go next? But first we're gonna stay in the Bangsamora. Balash, let's start with you. Thank you, Bea, and thank you very much for the two questions. Uh, let me begin with the second one, because that's easy to answer. Unfortunately, no. Uh, 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 basically, the, the, the logistical constraints of, of my research uh, uh, did not allow me to, uh, to expand uh, that much uh, into the different parts of the Bank Samoro. So uh, no, uh, my focus has been uh, basically Cotabato City and Maguindanao. So the participants came from that sort of central part of, uh, of the Bank Samoro, which as you are probably well aware better than me, uh, is the heartland of the MILF. Uh, so, so surely the dynamics are different in the in the island provinces. Uh, I had I had at least one respondent who comes from further north, uh, from one of the Lanao provinces, um, and uh, this participant was Maranao. So, uh, the the perspective that that this participant brought in uh, was slightly different uh, in to what I got. Um, uh, in the central parts. Um, now, to the first question, uh, I think yes. And uh, I think uh, defining it um, uh, would help operationalize it because then we would know what we are talking about. Uh, and then, uh, because, and this kind of reflects back to Marx's very good point, I think, about the tension between between the bureaucratization and the sort of radical emancipatory or liberation um, goals of the MILF. There is there is a genuine tension there, and I think I think when one takes over the reins of a of a modern state, uh, there is that pressure uh, to function bureaucratically, and there is the whole weight uh, of that uh, that state mess uh, that that you know, somehow militates, militates against the uh, the radical goals uh, of of an organization like the MILF. So I, I think that's a very genuine uh, tension there. Uh, but having said that, I think defining what it is uh, uh, would help uh, set 
you know, uh, policies uh, would help, you know, uh, create um, uh, monitoring and evaluation uh, systems, benchmarks, indicators, and so on. Uh, it could help create ways to, to enforce accountability. Uh, right now, there is a lot of informality. If you read the report, several of my respondents told me this anecdote about the chief minister's son running suspiciously successfully um, in different tenders. And apparently, according to several of my respondents, the chief minister actually instructed uh, ministries not to entertain his son anymore, uh, which which shows that he is actually serious about this uh, this idea of curbing corruption. Um, uh, but it's still an informal way of doing that, and it's a bit haphazard. Uh, so uh, so there is this this tension, I think, which is uh, which is there, and defining it in one way or another would help. Um, so that would be my answer. It can be a it can be a mostly religious definition, which is one of the ways that people define moral governance, or it can be more of a liberal uh, sort of modern definition, which is another way uh, that that I have come across. But however is defined, once you define it, you know what to uh, monitor, what to evaluate, what to enforce in your Th activities. Thank you, Balas. Mark, would you agree? Yeah, um, I think to an extent, yes, I think it, it's it won't cure everything, but it's it's I think quite an, an important step for the you know it's not just for MILF as you know the sitting government, but MILF as supposedly as some as you know as a movement that you know tries to capture the representation or aspirations of you know of, of the Bangsamoro, and so I think unpacking what that looks like, I think you know sets you know how how what is its vision that differentiates this project from the ARMM or from the usual setup. And I think that's where, and Balash is quite right, that's where I think civil society could either hold them to account or even, you know, partner with certain sections of the 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 um, MILF and, and the government so that we could, you know, um, push it, not just in, in the barn, but also nationally. Thank you, Mark. Diana, can I invite you for your last, uh words of reflection and maybe also a pointer of where to apply our analytic uh, vigor next. Uh -oh. Great, thanks. Thank you. And thank you for the question. I just put, typed something in because I was wondering here whether I found this the idea of moral governance also very interesting. And there's certain so much pressure that I wondered, there's such a broad definition of corruption. Um, and it means so many things to so many different people, some of which are abuse of power for personal gain, and some of which really have to do with how the whole set of rules are really stacked up against certain people. Um, and this failure to be specific about what we're talking about also can lead to some lack of definition. I was just wondering in your perspective, whether that's um, an issue, because that's generally an issue in the anti-corruption field, I think, as well. We throw around corruption for all sorts of purposes. Um, I, uh, you know, I was thinking about this and, and I think one of the things that made this case study very interesting is to really look at the implementation process as well as the peace process. Um, so as I look at some of these, I, there were three that came to mind and maybe because I've been working around them for a while too. Um, one is Guatemala, um, which has had a lot of ups and downs, and it's it's different in this um, in this than um, than the Philippines, uh, South Africa, um, which is where I started my career, which has a much longer history and now is quite troubled uh, because it, in the Philippines the sort of political plans and the political dynasties are, are different than sort of the the um, the political party and some of the other state capture issues, and certainly in um, really around thinking about that connection of co um, corruption and conflict, the state capture issue, I think is a really important one. Um, so Bosnia would be another one that I would mm -hmm. wonder um, there. And these are places where corruption, I think, is also highly um, politicized, not just political, but um, very politicized, which it sounds in the Philippines, this is not quite as much the case. You had some consensus on dealing with that. Um, and that's a particular challenge, I think, as we think about some of these entry points. Thank you so much, Joshua. I will sort of move to you finally before saying goodbye to our audience. Thanks, Bea. And I mean, yeah, thanks also very much to to all the, the other speakers. Um, I mean, I think in terms of 
what we're hoping to to look at next. Um, I think what made this case also extremely interesting was that, however qualified it it it, there are elements of of success. And I think you know we have so many examples of things not working out, and and often that's kind of overdetermined, right? Lots of things come together that mean um, that that mean things fall apart, and and so I think the ideally um you know we would like to 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 look at another sort of qualified success we we have lots of knowledge about what doesn't work but we want to probe a little bit what what does sometimes in specific contexts you know with all of the caveats that that that, that belong around that um and so you know if you if you in the audience have suggestions for us to let us know and otherwise uh, watch this space Thank you very much. A big thank you to you, Valesh, for engaging in this research with your wealth of uh, connection and, and understanding. A big thank you to you, Mark and Diana and Joshua, for engaging with it today in this space. I take from it that it's incredibly important to be specific when we talk about corruption in what we mean, but at the same time that it is necessary to look at corruption also in its systemic uh, character um, and to go beyond uh, just pinpointing it as uh, several of you have said an individual moral failing and to look at what's driving it and with what function if we want to make progress in turning sort of corruption into more sort of moral clarity or accountability and integrity um, for the Bang Zamora, I take with me sort of a, a, a recommendation to work sort of in, in dual tracks to really make sure that there's a strong civil society, but to also focus support and, and uh, attention to what is happening at, in, in the areas of governance around constitution making, around electoral laws. Um, and finally, one of the things that I also take with me is that corruption is often a uh, tied intimately to social norms and that sort of a work on over time and with a lot of patience shifting uh, uh, social norms is an integral part of working towards most more accountability and integrity in in many countries um with that i want to say thank you i hope you've enjoyed the lunch hour the evening meal hour or your breakfast with us um, and as my colleague Joshua said, do watch this space. Um, we'll come back with more insights, not just on that, but on conflict transformation and peace processes in general. Um, thank you very much and uh, goodbye. <laughs>